This is Father Wathen. The title of this program is The New Catechism of the Catholic Church, Number 1, the Fourth Series. Let us say a prayer. This is Psalm 118 in the Douay Reims Bible. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that search His testimonies, that seek Him with their whole heart. For they that work iniquity have not walked in His ways. Thou hast commanded Thy commandments to be kept most diligently. O oh, that my ways may be directed to keep Thy justifications. Then shall I not be confounded when I shall look into all Thy commandments. I will praise Thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned the judgments of Thy justice. I will keep Thy justifications. O do not Thou utterly forsake me. Psalm 118, verses 1 to 8. In this program, we return to the subject of the New Catechism of the Catholic Church. Our interest in this series is on our text's treatment of the Ten Commandments. Before going any further, I wish to make a few observations which pertain to the New Catechism in general. The first is that the subject of our study is a typically bold work. The French revolutionary Danton dictated the famous dictum, L'audace, toujours l'audace, boldness, always boldness. This advice has proved to be very right. The first and most important reason this is so is that the bolder the act, the more unexpected and the more unbelievable the act. Unbelievable so that it will not be believed that so atrocious an act would ever be considered much less attempted. This is what we have witnessed in the conciliar revolution which manifested itself in earnest with the reign of Pope John XXIII and his Second Vatican Council. Since the Council, we have seen such audacious and fierce strikes against the universal church as men refuse to think possible, with the result that in their denial... more than articulate what is brazenly before them. The Second Vatican Council was a virtual coup d'etat, or in this case, a coup d'église. In the course of the council, a sizable majority of the some 2,500 bishops in attendance were changed from basically unwary Catholics to fervent humanists and anti-Catholic revolutionists. They voted in sessions 2, 3, and 4 for schemata, which they would not have voted for in session 1. Once the bishops had voted for the 16 decrees of the council, they were either completely disarmed or completely brainwashed, so that ever after they were, to a greater or lesser extent, active collaborators in the wrecking of the church. Now, a generation later, the Catholic Episcopacy is a conciliar episcopacy who think that the conciliar religion is the Catholic religion and they implement it with all the power at their disposal. Amid all these assaults on the church and its traditional beliefs, rites and customs, which the bishops and priests do not have the honesty to call by their true names, none has been bolder and more harmful than the introduction of the Novus Ordo Misse, which we Catholics refer to as the New Mass, which, by the way, is a much more accurate description of it than its Latin name, which translates the New Order of the Mass, another falsehood. We shall have ample time in weeks to come to discuss this subject. Those who do not want to wait should call the Christ the King Latin Center and order a copy of my book, The Great Sacrilege, in which I treat of it with a little boldness of my own. Suffice it to say here what every Catholic who is over forty ought long ago to have seen without any coaching, what is written on the back cover of this book, and I quote, The new Mass does not involve papal infallibility. 
the Apostolic Constitution, Missali Romanum, of Pope Paul VI, is null and void. The Apostolic Constitution, Quo Primum, of Pope St. Pius V, is still in effect. The Tridentine Mass is the only Mass of the Latin Rite. The new Mass is new. The new Mass is illegal. The new Mass is immoral. The new Mass is not Catholic. The new Mass, if we believe the Council of Trent and official documents of the Church, is no Mass at all. The new Mass is the great sacrilege. It has been said that he is truly an arrogant and mischievous fellow who would say such things, which is to miss the point altogether. That act which created and introduced and led the Catholic faithful to believe that they were legally bound to accept the new Mass under the pain of sin and damnation was and continues to be the arrogant and horrid act and boldest to which few acts in history can be compared. This anyone who reads my book will see without great effort, will not be able to avoid seeing. The new catechism of the Catholic Church is another incredibly bold strike, which has been accepted by practically everyone, because by now, thirty-odd years after the Council, which ended in 1965, the people are so completely unmoored from their faith that generally they know no difference between Catholicity and Protestantism, and humanism, and liberalism, and evolutionism, and communism, and all the other popular isms and ideologies which they are being taught in their churches, colleges, schools, and seminars throughout the world. Another reason for this boldness, which is the watchword of the revolution, is the natural inertia of man. Practically everyone is inclined to stay where he is, to do what he has been doing, to believe what he has believed. He tends to be inactive or active in a rote and habitual way, to be in a stable and defensive mode. When the revolutionist moves against him, he is disinclined to resist. He does not want to fight, to argue, or to cause trouble, if he can avoid it, because such activities require energy, courage, and assurance. He is inclined to want to be agreeable, to avoid calling attention to himself. He does not want to appear unreasonable or contentious or singular. Thus he tends to move where he is pushed, to go along to get along, as the saying goes. The revolutionist knows exactly where he is going. He has an extended agenda which may take him many years to complete. It consists of one aggressive step after another, whose subversive purpose practically everyone else is both ignorant and incredulous of. When the revolutionaries are priests and bishops, whom Catholics think it is their religious duty to obey and follow without question, it is not surprising that they should do so, even when the priests and bishops begin to go in exactly the opposite direction from what has been the tradition and the obligation for the entire history of their church. Catholics are inclined to ignore Protestant preachers and non-Catholic leaders generally, but to accept whatever their clergy tell them. Their thinking being, if you cannot trust your priests and your bishops, whom can you trust? We lay people do not know theology. We know what is in the Baltimore Catechism, but they are the experts. That is what our religion is, going along with the Pope and the bishops and the priests. That is what we are supposed to do. It is sinful not to do this. Thus it is that through obedience, the bishops and the priests have herded the vast majority of the trusting faithful into heresy and the state of sin. What is worse than that, however, is that over the decades, the clergy have deprived them of the reality of their faith. The Catholic people no longer see or hear Catholic truth, so that they have either forgotten it or never learned it. By now, what little Catholic truth they ever hear is unfamiliar and foreign, something forbidden and even repugnant to them, as it is to Protestants and other non-believers. When, therefore, he hears someone like myself, who speaks like an old-fashioned priest, 
A contemporary Catholic presumes that such a person is a mountebank, a troublemaker, and a false teacher, even though he says nothing but what used to be taught in all the schools and parishes of the Church. To make matters more difficult for such a Catholic layman or laywoman, all the priests and the bishops say that anyone who persists in the old religion is a rebel and a lawbreaker. Protestants and atheists and communists are no longer the breakers of God's laws, but all who have not gone the way of the conciliar revolution. Despite all, however, it must be said very plainly that the Catholic clergy, from the highest to the lowest, are all involved in this monstrous deception, though most certainly not to the same extent. Some priests, and possibly some bishops, must try to convince themselves that they have no part in the new religion, that they are opposing it, that they are doing their bit to withstand it. It is a self-deception, because they are very much a part of the scheme, and they are contributing nothing toward the exposure of this conspiracy, which is damning souls and merging the official church into the one world religion, the religion of world brotherhood, the anti-religion of the worship of man. Any priest who has not removed himself from this movement is playing a very necessary part in its progress. The movement requires that there be a very broad spectrum of belief and tolerance so as to draw in and keep the millions of Catholics who refuse to believe that they have abandoned the true faith. Any priest or bishop or cardinal or pope who does not identify both with his voice and his conduct this false religion which now prevails in the Catholic Church, whose doctrine is dilated in the pages of the New Catechism, is a most useful player in this vicious game. And any lay person who does not withdraw from it, no matter how angry or uncooperative or reluctant or inactive or unaware he may be, is also a part of it, a contributor to it, and will be condemned with it. One of the notes we have insisted on with respect to the New Catechism is that it attempts to establish the new religion, which is embedded within its pages of orthodox teaching, as the gospel taught by Christ, the apostles, and all their successors. This is most assuredly not true. Another mark of the new catechism, which I have mentioned before, is that even though we have here a thick tome of almost 700 pages, one cannot miss the fact that there is no warmth or unction toward either the Catholic religion or its heretical substratum in those who have produced it. I have told you before why this is. It is because the bishops and their authors have no feeling toward any religion, they being above all soulless functionaries who approach this task as they must approach all the steps of their revolutionary agenda in the same fashion, as something to be done, a goal to be achieved, a project to be accomplished. As a consequence, the undeniable attribute of this work, something which its authors could not control for all their devotion to their sinister cause and their not inconsiderable erudition, they could not impart to its pages anything remotely suggestive of love, of true faith, or spiritual enthusiasm. This spirit, or should I say this unspirit, is particularly observable in the chapter which we are now considering, that which deals with God's law in general and the Ten Commandments in particular. In many ways the treatise on the commandments is very good, but it suffers the obvious disadvantage of having been produced by faithless individuals who don't believe a word of it and who are themselves lawbreakers of the first water. With them there is neither reason for the law nor belief in the primordial lawgiver, as there is no fear of breaking it or corrupting it. For them this whole project is as cold and mechanical as that of an abortionist, they the latter-day killers of Christ and his church and his little sheep. The New Catechism treats the subject of the Ten Commandments in terms of God's salvation, law, and grace following our paragraphs which teach us of the moral law. As I said, most of this is good material, hence we would do well to learn it. I begin with paragraph 1950, quotations. 
The moral law is the work of divine wisdom. Its biblical meaning can be defined as fatherly instruction, God's pedagogy. It prescribes for a man the ways, the rules of conduct that lead to the promised beatitude. It proscribes the ways of evil which turn him away from God and his love. It is at once firm in the precepts and in its promises worthy of love. Law is rule of conduct enacted by a competent authority for the sake of the common good. The moral law presupposes the rational order established among creatures for their good and to serve their final end, but the power, wisdom, and goodness of the Creator. All law finds its first and ultimate truth in the eternal law. Law is declared and established by reason as a participation in the providence of the living God, Creator and Redeemer of all. Such an ordinance of reason is what one calls law. There are different expressions of the moral law, all of them interrelated. Eternal law, the source in God of all law, natural law, revealed law comprising the old law and the new law, or law of the gospel. Finally, civil and ecclesiastical law. The moral law finds its fullness and its unity in Christ. Jesus Christ is in person the way of perfection. He is the end of the law, for only he teaches and bestows the justice of God. For Christ is the end of the law that everyone who has faith may be justified, said St. Paul in the letter to the Romans. Man participates in the wisdom and goodness of the Creator, who gives him mastery over his acts and the ability to govern himself with a view to the true and the good. The natural law expresses the original moral sense which enables man to discern by reason the good and the evil, the truth and the lie. The natural law is written and engraved in the soul of each and every man because it is human reason ordaining him to do good and forbidding him to sin. But this command of human reason would not have the force of law if it were not the voice and interpreter of a higher reason to which our spirit and our freedom must be submitted. The divine and natural law shows man the way to follow so as to practice the good and attain his end. The natural law states the first and essential precepts which govern the moral life. It hinges upon the desire for God and submission to Him, who is the source and judge of all that is good, as well as upon the sense of the Decalogue. This law is called natural, not in reference to the nature of irrational beings, but because reason which decrees it properly be belongs to human nature. Where then are the rules written, if not in the book of that light we call the truth? In it is written every just law. From it the law passes into the heart of the man who does justice, not that it migrates into it, but that it places its imprint on it, like a seal on a ring that passes on to wax without leaving the ring. The natural law is nothing other than the light of understanding placed in us by God. Through it, we know what we must do and what we must avoid. God has given this light or law at the creation. The natural law, present in the heart of each man and established by reason, is universal in its precepts and its authority extends to all men. It expresses the dignity of the person and determines the basis for his fundamental rights and duties. For there is a true law, right reason. It is in conformity with nature, is diffused among all men, and is immutable and eternal. Its orders summon to duty, its prohibitions turn away from offense. To replace it with a contrary law is a sacrilege. Failure to apply even one of its provisions is forbidden. No one can abrogate it entirely. The natural law is immutable and permanent throughout the variations of history. It subsists under the flux of ideas and customs and supports their progress. The rules that express it remain substantially valid. Even when it is rejected in its principles, 
It cannot be destroyed or removed from the heart of man. It always rises again in the life of individuals and societies. The natural law, the Creator's very good work, provides the solid foundation on which man can build the structure of moral rules to guide his choices. It also provides the indispensable moral foundation for building the human community. Finally, it provides the necessary basis for the civil law with which it is connected, whether by a reflection that draws conclusions from its principles or by additions of a positive and juridical nature. The precepts of natural law are not perceived by everyone clearly and immediately. In the present situation, sinful man needs grace and revelation, so moral and religious truths may be known by everyone with facility, with firm certainty, and with no admixture of error. The natural law provides revealed law and grace with a foundation prepared by God and in accordance with the work of the Spirit. The old law is the first stage of revealed law. Its moral prescriptions are summed up in the Ten Commandments. The precepts of the Decalogue lay the foundations for the vocation of man fashioned in the image of God. They prohibit what is contrary to the love of God and neighbor and prescribe what is essential to it. The Decalogue is a light offered to the conscience of every man to make God's call and ways known to him and to protect him against evil. As St. Augustine said, God wrote on the tables of the law what men did not read in their hearts. According to Christian tradition, the law is holy, spiritual, and good, yet still imperfect. Like a tutor, it shows what must be done, but does not of itself give the strength, the grace of the Spirit, to fulfill it. Because of sin, which it cannot remove, it remains a law of bondage. According to St. Paul, its special function is to denounce and disclose sin, which constitutes a law of concupiscence in the human heart. However, the law remains the first stage on the way to the kingdom. It prepares and disposes the chosen people and each Christian for conversion and faith in the Savior God. It provides a teaching which endures forever, like the Word of God. The new law, or the law of the gospel, is the perfection here on earth of the divine law, natural and revealed. It is the work of Christ and is expressed particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. It is also the work of the Holy Spirit and through Him it becomes that interior law of charity. I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Close quotations. You may imagine that this allusion to the law of the gospel and the Sermon on the Mount causes that the law of the New Testament is the law of the New Testament church, and that the people whom the Catechism is referring to here and indicating that they will have God's law in their hearts are the Catholic people. Oh, no. You will not find the word Catholic anywhere in this treatise on the commandments. As I have told you many times before, the new catechism labors arduously to erase the line between the Catholic faithful and all the other children of Adam. I resume with paragraph 1966. The new law is the grace of the Holy Spirit given to the faithful through faith in Christ. It works through charity it uses the Sermon on the Mount to teach us what must be done and makes use of the sacraments to give us the grace to do it. The law of the gospel fulfills, refines, surpasses, and leads the old law to its perfection. In the Beatitudes, the new law fulfills the divine promises by elevating and orienting them toward the kingdom of heaven. It is addressed to those open to accepting this new hope with faith, the poor, the humble, the afflicted, the pure of heart, those persecuted on account of Christ, and so marks out the surprising ways of the kingdom. The law of the gospel fulfills the commandments of the law. The Lord's Sermon on the Mount, far from abolishing or devaluing the moral prescriptions of the old law, releases their hidden potential 
and has new demands arise from them. It reveals their entire divine and human truth. It does not add new external precepts, but proceeds to reform the heart, the root of human acts, where a man chooses between the pure and the impure, where faith, hope, and charity are formed, and with them the other virtues. The gospel thus brings the law to its fullness through imitation of the perfection of the Heavenly Father, through the forgiveness of enemies and prayer for the persecutors, in emulation of the divine generosity. To the Lord's Sermon on the Mount, it is fitting to add the moral catechesis of the apostolic teachings, such as Romans chapters 12 to 15, the first letter to the Corinthians, chapters 12 and 13, the letter to the Colossians, chapters 3 and 4, the letter to the Ephesians, chapters 4 and 5, and other such sources. This doctrine hands on the Lord's teaching with the authority of the apostles, particularly in the presentation of the virtues that flow from faith in Christ and are animated by charity, the principal gift of the Holy Spirit. Let charity be genuine. Love one another with brotherly affection. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. This catechesis also teaches us to deal with the cases of conscience in the light of our relationship to Christ and to the Church. The new law is called the law of love because it makes us act out of the love infused by the Holy Spirit rather than from fear. A law of grace, because it confers the strength of grace to act by means of faith and the sacraments. A law of freedom, because it sets us free from the ritual and juridical observances of the old law, inclines us to act spontaneously by the prompting of charity, and finally lets us pass from the condition of a servant who does not know what his master is doing, to that of a friend of Christ. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you, or even to the status of son and heir. We come in our reading of the New Catechism to the treatment of grace and justification. This is sound Catholic doctrine, which we read with pleasure. We are at paragraph 1987. Quotations. The grace of the Holy Spirit has the power to justify us, that is, to cleanse us from our sins and to communicate to us the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ and through baptism. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. For we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves as dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Thus spoke St. Paul. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we take part in Christ's passion by dying to sin and in his resurrection by being born to a new life. We are members of his body, which is the church, branches grafted onto the vine, which is himself. As St. Athanasius said, God gave Himself to us through His Spirit. By the participation of the Spirit, we become communicants in the divine nature. For this reason, those in whom the Spirit dwells are divinized. Close quotations. I conclude by remarking with great reluctance that there is a very obvious reason why these paragraphs are quite acceptable. The revolutionaries who now control the Catholic Church want the Catholic faithful to obey them. They have jurisdiction within the Church, a goal patiently and dearly paid for. And now they teach those subject to them to be law-abiding and obedient, humble and subservient. They are in power, and their power is greatest if the people are convinced that in obeying them they are obeying Almighty God, when in fact... They are destroying their souls. This is the work of the revolution, after all. So to corrupt the thinking of men that they confuse bad and good, sin and virtue. 
so that they call heresy truth and truth heresy and desecration worship and worship desecration and deviance fidelity and fidelity deviance.